<clears throat> Hosea 6. Hosea 6. <laughs> I find it very odd that this sermon will be extremely appropriate, and I think it's going to be very needed today. Uh, it's not a surprise that after a great revival meeting that the devil starts moving and the devil starts attacking. And there is also, after a revival meeting, a fresh and strong spirit. And that's what I want to talk about today. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1 through 2. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. The doctrinal application is about the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel have been in a backsliding condition, but they have now received a revival. God is going to revive and restore his people in the future and times. It says at verse 2 that after two days he'll revive us. And the third day, which is after the revival, the third day is going to be better. It's not just revival. He's going to raise us up. And just like the children of Israel as their nation, ought the Christian church, when they go through their days of revival, that the next day after the revival, that's when they're raised up on high. We shouldn't just uh, fall back down to the ground after we get revived. After revival, we should be raised up and we should have our feet firmly planted on solid ground, on a firm foundation and stay firm, standing on the promises of God. I found a lot of interesting passages in the Bible. We're going to go through nine revivals in the Bible. They had their own revival meetings. And it's very interesting to see what happened after the revival meeting. And I think it will be very needed today. I don't know if it can uh, convict or help people today, but I believe it's very needful, especially the situation we're going through. The title, the title of my message is very simple. After revival. After revival. Yeah. Let's pray. Now, Father, you're going to have to cleanse me of my sins, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit. And the reason why, Lord, you'll have to is because I am an unworthy vessel who's preaching your book. So I need you that much. At my own strength, I am nothing. I pray that in spite of the devil's attacks and the hardships people go through, it will somehow make them hear this message. The Holy Spirit reach them. And may we come out even stronger and mightier than we did before. So far, that's what this church has done. It's been attacked, but it's got up even better. I pray you'll do so again, Father. You're a great God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Genesis 35. We're going to look through nine scriptures because we're going to look at nine revivals. Go to Genesis 35. Genesis 35. The first revival is with Jacob. The first revival is with Jacob. He tells uh, his own people to cast away their idols and to change their garments. And the people cast away their strange gods. They changed their garments. They had a revival at their own Bethel. And they were seeking the ways of the Lord. They were cleaning up their sins, their old ways, and starting to take things seriously for the Lord. Look at Genesis 35, verse 2. The Bible reads, And Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak, which was by Shechem. Man, what a great revival meeting. A lot of preachers have preached messages just from 3, 4, and 5. That they will go to the house of God. That they will take away and clean up their idolatry and their sins. And that Jacob made sure that all the sin that they were hid underneath the ground. A lot that you can glean here to preach a great revival meeting. But this message is focusing after revival. What happened after revival? Look at verse 8 
And that's my first point, the catastrophe after revival. The catastrophe after revival. Verse 8, but Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak. And the name of it was called Alon Bakuth. You know what happens after revival? You're going to have catastrophes happening to you. You're going to have a bunch of people getting sick. You're going to have a bunch of people who get mad. You're going to have people leaving the church all of a sudden. You're going to have some kind of trial that happened in your home, in your family, in your church, in your workplace, something unexpected, even a flat tire. Some kind of catastrophe, some trial will happen right after a revival meeting. How many of you have went through that? How many of you know what I'm talking about? This church has went through so much that we already know. It's uh, not a strange to us anymore. The reason why things happen is because Satan, he knows that you're revived, so he wants to make sure you stay down. You know, you were originally down, but you got revived, right? So you're going up. He doesn't want you to go up. What's he going to do? Swat you back down. He doesn't want you revived. That's why you must be ready for catastrophes when they happen. And when they happen, all you have to do is just hang on. Just hang on until the blessing comes. Look, it's not forever. Look, it's not like, oh, I'm doomed to die this way. No, this church has been through enough trials where they held on to God and then the blessing happened, right? You just have to hang on until the blessing comes. The blessing will come. Don't worry. You're not defeated and you're not going to die this way. It's just temporary. Amen. It's just temporary. Just hang on. And then when that time passes by, you're going to forget it. Because how many of you recall the trials, all, every single trial that you went through? Not every single one of them, right? It's come and gone. So there are some that you remember, but there's a lot of others that you don't remember. Why? Because it's behind you. It's temporary. That's how long you have to wait. Temporary. That's it. So just hold on until the blessing comes. The reason why the trial happens is because the devil knows the blessing that's going to come. So he doesn't want you to get that upcoming blessing. So he tries to make the trial so vivid and real and hard to you that you can miss out the blessing and quit on God. So that's why, no, just hang on a little longer, just a little bit more. Just hold on. It's only temporary. It's not permanent. The blessing will come down. How long do I have to hang on? Until the blessing comes. That's it. Until the blessing comes. That's it. Some of you might say, well, you know, I did receive a blessing. I can acknowledge that, but it's not really full, Pastor. And my trial is not really done. It keeps popping up here and there. Well, you have to realize that within every trial you go through, you forget there's always a blessing after that. And then a trial happens after that, and then a blessing comes after that. You know what the Christian life is? Trial, blessing, trial, blessing, trial, blessing, trial, blessing. That's what it is. And if you look at this passage, verse 8, Jacob went through the trial, right? Lost Deborah, one of his wives. When Deborah died, what happened after that? Look at the very next verse. And God appeared unto Jacob again, and he came out of Paddan Aram, and what? Blessed him. See, after the trial, you get a blessing. Yeah, that's good. Then what happens after that? God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. Bless God. Hallelujah. He got the blessing. And verse 19, trial. Trial happened at verse 19. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. Then uh, look what happened at verse 22. Trial again. And it came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. Wow, a scandal happened in the family. Then what happened after that? Blessing. Verse 27. And Jacob came unto Isaac, his father, unto Mamre. Jacob finally got to see his father that he hasn't seen in a long time. He got a blessing. What do you see here? Trial, blessing, 
Trial, blessing, trial, blessing, trial, blessing. That's the Christian life. So don't get discouraged when trials happen because what that means is what's after trial is blessing. So enjoy it while you still can. And then when the trial happens again, oh, the trial's happening again. Hey, just hang on until blessing and then enjoy it. And then when the trial happens again, just hang on until blessing. All right. So that's what you need to do. Yes, after a revival meeting, there's trial, but you forget every trial must have every blessing accompanying it. So hang on. That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen after a revival meeting. So when catastrophes happen, just hold on. The blessing is coming right your way, knocking on your doorstep, okay? The devil just wants you to miss out the delivery, all right? That's knocking on your door. So just hang on. Exodus 15. Exodus 15. My second point is the care after revival. The care after revival. Look at verse 20 of Exodus chapter 15. The Jews, they had a great revival meeting. I mean... What happened was Pharaoh, the powerful Egyptian empire, were drowned in the Red Sea. And then Miriam and a bunch of sisters got up and they started to dance for the Lord and they started to praise, sing and shout. And, you know, they had their own summer camp, their own revival meeting, shouting and singing unto the Lord. Look at Exodus 15, verse 20. And Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider at the throne into the sea. And that sounds like you and I, jumping up and down, dancing around, whooping, uh, whooping and hollering and short, saying, Praise the Lord, thank God he delivered me from this problem. God is worthy to be praised, and we get a summer camp. Then verse 22, after revival. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Wow. Well, after revival, what happened? The Jews quickly got drained. They quickly got drained. Why? Because they're wandering out in the wilderness. They got drained so fast. It's only a few days. Did you see that? Verse 22, three days. <laughs> right after, imagine a revival meeting in your church. Three days, you start going, where is the Lord? God, why aren't you providing my needs? Three days ago, you were saying, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And then three days later, God, why, why, why didn't you provide my need? What happened? They were going out by their own strength in the wilderness. They never prayed to the Lord for water. They never talked to Moses kindly and believed God's promise. Wow, you can do miracles with that rod. Can you do something for us? No, three days, they just went... And then bitterness and wrong thoughts start to pop out. Where, what, why, why, where's the water? Why, he brought us out here to die. And then they're pushing by their own strength. And then that's why they got drained so easily. And all it took was what? Days. That's it. Day and time just needs to pass by for you to go back to ground zero. The problem with Christians nowadays is they're like the Jews after a big revival meeting, they get drained. Why? Because you're out wandering in the wilderness. And out wandering in the wilderness, you're going by your own strength. You're not getting the care and the sustenance and the water that is needed from the Lord. The second point is the care after revival. The care after revival. The Jews, they can be well cared for if they would only ask, if they would only seek God's ways, if they would only believe in his promise. But no, they just kept it all in, just went out by their own strength, 
And all it took was three days in the wilderness. You know what it takes for you to backslide? Just three days by your own strength. Just, you know, I don't need to call pastor for help and I don't need counseling and I don't need prayer and, you know, I can skip my Bible reading and prayer for just for today. I don't need to go to church that Sunday. You know, uh, I don't have to, you know, what you're doing, you're draining yourself of the spiritual nourishment, the spiritual care that you desperately need. All it takes is less than three days for you to go back to the ways of the flesh. You can't fight by the doings and the might of your flesh. You need care from on high. Look, if you're in trouble, did you pray to the Lord? It's that simple. But you didn't. You went by your own strength. You didn't pray desperately. Cry out for help to God. You didn't pray specifically what your problem is. You didn't pour out your specific complaint to the Lord. You never sought for a specific answer to the Lord. Or maybe he did. The Jews, they had, they had their sustenance, their care all this time. They had Moses with the rod. All they had to do was ask. No, they waited three days and then started to complain at him. You know, all you had was that book in your house. Well, I'm all alone and I don't have, You have that book. Are you reading it? Are you reading it? Are you praying to the Lord? Hey, we, we got technology like the one brother pray. Hey, are you watch if, if you're unable to come to church today because of health issues or some very good reasons, are you watching right now? Everybody in our church watching right now? Ah, see? So the problem is, is that when God has the care given and provided for you, you just don't take it. No, you go by your own strength. No, I don't need to listen to the preaching today. No, I don't need to go to church today. I can go out by my own strength. That's why you lose your revival. It only takes a couple days. Passing days can drain you. All that a day has to do is just pass by in order to drain your revival. That's why the Bible says redeeming the time. Why? The days are what? Evil. You have to go against the days. How do you go against the days? If the Jews got their care from Moses' rod from day one to begin with. Then they wouldn't have complained. They wouldn't have gotten drained. They would have gotten all the water that they needed. But no, you let the day pass without the rod, without the care, without prayer, without Bible reading, without fellow brethren, without winning a soul to Christ, without crying out to God for help, seeking counsel from the minister. You go away. You let the day pass by. If you start all the way from day one, you wouldn't be drained. Why do you have to be in a revival meeting to stay hydrated? No, in order to get, uh, to, for your energy not to be drained and to be watered after a revival meeting, you need to keep that revival going. Keep it going. Have your own revival. Spend time with the Lord. Pray, sing, shout. Get away from the world a bit. Why, did, why is it only a revival meeting that you do all that, huh? You need to keep yourself hydrated. Don't be dehydrated and drained down in the wilderness. That's what happened after revival. You get drained, so you need good care. What's your care system going, huh? Uh, go to Joshua 6, Joshua 6. Joshua chapter 6. The third point is the concealing after revival. The concealing after revival. You know what's going to happen? After a revival meeting, you're going to be so lost in the bliss of revival and the victory God has given to you that deep down behind the scenes, there's a sin that's being concealed. 
there's an issue and a problem, an attack from the wicked one that's concealed right underneath your nose and you're too blind to see it. And that thing is still... While you're shouting and reviving, don't you know the devil is underground lingering? Why is that? Because you didn't take care of that issue. You know what happened right here? Look at this. The victory and the revival in Jericho. This looks like a revival meeting. Look at verse 16. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout! For the Lord hath given you the city! Wow! Look at this. They were shouting for the Lord. That's a revival meeting. Verse 17. And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. Wow, look at that. Soul saved at verse 17. Man, what a revival meeting. Man, we got some people saved at our summer camp, at our revival meeting. We got some people that got baptized. Wow, bless God. Soul saved. And then verse 18, And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed. When he take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Look at verse 18. They went down on the altar. They surrendered their sins to the Lord. They got rid of their accursed things. Verse 19. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Man, look at that. Sanctification. Not only did they turn from their sin, they turned to the Lord. They surrendered to the Lord. And they said, here, is my, uh, here are my things, my precious things, Father. And I sacrifice my life. I surrender all to you. You own it, Lord. Wow, what a great revival meeting. A great victory against Jericho. And then look at uh, verse 27. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was noised throughout all the country. Man, what a revival, meaning that the Lord was spreading it all over the country. And then chapter 7, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the incursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Wow. While the Jews were shouting the victory over Jericho, behind the scenes they overlooked something. That one, it's only one thing, one person. One. Just one. To cause problem for the entire church. For the entire group. And for the Lord's curse to fall upon the Jews. Because of that sin that Achan did at verse 1, guess what? The Jews lost a good amount of people at their next battle. And they had no idea what was going on. You know, you must make sure to be watchful and see if there's one thing that's overlooked that can kill all the church. You know what your problem is after a revival meeting? Oh, praise the Lord! Let's take over the world! And then you overlook that one thing. You're not watchful. Sh don't, don't get me wrong. You shouldn't lose your shout. You shouldn't lose your joy in the Lord. Lose your revival. But you shouldn't lose your watching as well. Your caution. You got to be careful of that one thing that can kill all the church. You got to say... I better be watchful that I'm not on a hype mode. That I'm not in a temporary hype mode. I got to watch that. I got to keep this joy going. You got to go, I can't let loss of members, loss of attendance today, lose my revival mode. I got to be watchful of that. You know what your problem is after a revival meeting? You didn't expect for people to drop out of church today. You know what happens after a revival meeting? You don't expect that you would lose your joy and your hype that day. After a revival meeting, you don't expect that enemy waiting and saying, I'm going to find that one thing to kill the entire church and kill the whole revival. What is it? Maybe it's someone in your home, in your family. 
You have something in your workplace, in your life, something in your heart that you have not gotten rid of and surrendered to the Lord. Maybe there's something that the devil can find a weak spot. There's one thing and you must be watchful. You know what's going to happen? After the revival meeting, by the grace of God, I cannot lose my shout, my joy. And if God folds the building all of a sudden, if God takes away the people all of a sudden, if there's a big fight and division in the church all of a sudden, if our online ministry shuts down all of a sudden, I must be watchful and not let those things kill the whole revival. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep shouting, keep preaching, keep sowing and keep singing. Watch out. There's that one thing that's concealed. And don't let it kill all the revival. All right? Don't let little C-O-V-I-D, a.k.a. F-L-U, Kill the whole revival meeting. Just. March on. Ah, and then just kill the whole revival meeting. No! Keep shouting the victory! Yes! Amen. You know, some of you who couldn't come to church today, perhaps you just lost your shout and your victory. Bless God, you better fill up that WhatsApp and I better see a bunch of amens on it. Yes! Flood it! March Don't lose on. your shout. Why are you losing your shout right now? Don't lose your shout. Don't let a little thing, that one thing, kill the entire revival meeting. March on. Uh, it's always going to be concealed. So be careful at the revival meeting. Don't get so lost in joy and so lost in hype that you, that you lose your watching state of the enemy. Yeah. Always be ready. Say, I'm on guard after revival. After revival, okay, I'm on guard. Guard, I better drag myself to church. I better watch my health. I better pass out tracts. I better read that word and pray. I better stay away from that sin because he's going to pop out again. I better get ready for church. There might be a division or a dissension or a disagreement that the devil might pop up. I'm ready. Amen. Don't let something kill the entire revival meeting. Amen. All right, look at 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings chapter 13. You know what happens after a revival meeting? The con man. My fourth point is the con man after revival. The con man after revival. There's going to be a con man coming. He's going to trick you and deceive you. Look at this revival meeting. Verse 1. And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord. Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee. And men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. Man, look, at this is a young, zealous Christian. Young men, just like we have in our church, right? A young preacher, right? Being so bold, speaking out against the king, crying against the pagan altar and saying, all right, altar, you know what's going to happen? God's going to tear that altar down. He was preaching against that paganism right there. And then verse 4, And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand which he put forth against him dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Man, you know, after he preached, the king was like, how dare you, and tried to put his hand on him, and God struck him down with the disease on his hand. And at the same time, God rent and tore apart that pagan altar. Man, mighty power, hand of God. Look at this. Imagine if the mayor of San Francisco... Repented and got saved. Man, I, I, I'd lose my mind. I think there's a revival. I would think that I would believe in a last day worldwide revival after that if you can just get the mayor of San Francisco saved. <laughs> Look at this, man. 
he repented. Got right. Verse 6. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Oh, come home with me, and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. Look at that right there, man. He, total 180. He was like, Oh, you hate speech. We ought to lock you up. And he's like, oh, please pray for me. I repent. Let me welcome you inside my mansion in San Francisco, says the mayor. Come over here, you know. Let me feed you, you know. Let me give you a reward. Man, that would be the day. Imagine that this county just gave me a reward, you know. If that happened to me, I would, I would think I'm not right with God. I think I compromised at something. But this is important. What did the man of God say? At verse 8. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it charged me by the word of the Lord. Wow. Notice right here that after this revival meeting, listen up, after the revival meeting, this young, zealous Christian said, no, I remember what God told me. He told me not to do this. So I'm going to stick by my guns and say no. Notice he did that after revival meeting. Just like many young Christians today, after a great revival God has given to you, you know what you do? I remember what God told me. And no is the answer to the flesh and the world and sin. That's what you do, right? Oh, but look at this guy. Look at right here, verse 14. And went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that camest from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. Oh, look at that. Another guy comes out and invites him to eat at his home. But if you recall, at the previous verse, the young prophet said, I am not allowed to eat at somebody's house. And he said that, and look what he said, verse 16. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord. Okay, and the devil left him alone, right? The tempter, the tempter left him alone, right? Okay, you said, no, I'll leave you alone. No, verse 18. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. Guess what the young prophet did? So he went back with him and eat, did eat bread in his house and drank water. Wow. And you know what happened to that young prophet after that? He died because he disobeyed the word of the Lord. You know that, that next person that invited him to his home? He was a con man. He tricked him. Just because you say no to the first tempter doesn't mean that's the end. There will be a second tempter. Just because you said no to the first temptation doesn't mean that there is not a second temptation that will try harder to convince you. You know what your problem is? After revival, no! Praise the Lord, I got the victory. And then the next guy comes. And then you say, no! But then you forget the tempter is going to try harder. Wow, that's right there. You know, he's going he's to con you. You know what happens after a revival meeting? You always say no, and you might say no to the first tempter. But when the next tempter comes, you try to use the same no because it worked for you before, but this time it didn't work. The next tempter said, you know, just a little bit won't hurt. You know what the next tempter said? You know you're going to go back to it. It's only a matter of time. You know what the next tempter said? You know, it's not really that sinful. What makes you think it's sinful? You know what the next tempter does? He's a con man. He tricks you. Now, isn't this interesting? Isn't it interesting? Why do you believe the words of the tempter 
rather than the word of God that you heard the first time at your revival meeting. You know what you did to the first tempter? No, I remembered what I heard from the word of God. And no is the answer. What happened to the second tempter? Not as strong as before. You don't say, no, I remember the word from the preacher. No, you start to remember the words of the next tempter. You start to believe the words of the next tempter. You know what you need to do after a revival meeting when the con man comes out? Simple, don't believe him. And believe the word of God. It's that simple. You got to believe that the next tempter is lying to you. The next tempter is lying to you saying, you're too weak to do this. You know, it it's always happens. It always happens. You get right and you fall back again. Oh, that's the tempter. You know what you need to do? You need to believe that he's a liar. And you need to believe the word of God. But you know why you don't believe the word of God? Simple, you forgot. After the revival meeting, you forgot. Oh, what happened to your notes you were writing before? Huh? What happened to the preaching that burned your heart before? Huh? You forgot. And because you forgot, that's why you can't believe the word of God. And you believe the word of somebody else. Hey, how many of you, after your revival meeting, you remember what was preached that helped you? Did you forget? What made you come on the altar? It wasn't just a show, was it? Wasn't it the word that the preacher was speaking? Yeah. There was something there in the middle of the preaching, that one of those words that hit you, remember? Did you remember that one street that the pastor preached about? Did you remember not revival but repair that the preacher preached about? Did you remember, don't pity the Tobiah who's holding a homeless sign on the street Thrust him down the road. Do you remember that one? You forgot. You forgot. And that's why after revival, you fall back into place again because of that con man. The con man. Whatever the next tempter makes you hear or even feel, don't believe it. You forgot what you, this is important, didn't you? Did you forget what you felt at the revival meeting as well? The tempter might not make you hear his words, but he can make you feel him. The tempter can make you feel him. Feel the fear, feel the lust, feel the depression, feel the suicide, feel the loneliness, feel the emptiness and despair. Don't believe what you feel from the tempter. Did you forget? Do you believe what you felt from the singing at the revival meeting? The preaching at the revival meeting? The fellowship at the revival meeting? Did you believe? Don't you believe in those things? Or did you forget? You forget. You forgot. All right. First Kings 18. First Kings 18. I think the Lord's on to something today. Amen. All right, I think the Lord's on to something today. Let's look at 1 Kings 18. My fifth point is the crash after revival. A crash after revival. Now this is very important, okay? This is a really good point here. Now notice that Elijah, he had a great revival meeting. I mean, he got fired to come down out of heaven. He just conquered over a hundred false preachers and prophets. Me, I don't think I kicked over a hundred of them online and I already got a, the whole world hating me for just kicking ten, you know, false prophets. But Elijah just kicked out, kicked, you know, over a hundred, you know, and then the whole people sided with them. They all had a revival. They said, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah, he had so much power that he caused rain to come out of heaven on an area that had famine and drought for over three years. Man, what a revival. And not only that, Elijah was able to beat the race car of King Ahab by just his own feet. Man, what a revival. 
Look at, look at, look at right here. 1 Kings 18, verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Man, praise the Lord, after the preaching, revival, 38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the sacrifice. Verse 39, and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God. Verse 40, Elijah said unto them, take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. Verse 41, Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. Verse 46, And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Man, what a revival, man. Elijah saw all of this. What a great revival meeting. You wouldn't doubt God after that. You would press on for God after that. Look what immediately happens after such a big revival meeting. Immediately. Same day of the revival, actually. Same day of the revival. Look at the next verse. Chapter 19, verse 1. 19, verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Guess what happened? And Elijah stood strong in the Lord. No, verse 3, and when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. <laughs> what in the world? Elijah, why are you so scared of a woman after you conquered uh, over a hundred prophets of Baal and the king? You took on a whole nation, and what one woman said scared you and made you ran? What in the world? How would you get so scared after that? Maybe some husbands might understand, right? <laughs> yeah, I take that as an amen. <laughs> Maybe some husbands might understand that, right? But the thing is, is that for, uh, forgetting the joking part right here, it's something that sometimes we wonder, Elijah, why would you be so scared? It doesn't make sense. You know what happens after a revival meeting? It's something that's unexplainable, and you don't understand it, you can't explain it, but it just shook you to the core. And then you just dropped out of church all of a sudden. You just suddenly just dropped your Bible reading and prayer. It's unexplainable. You don't know how to explain it. It's just something where you are so pumped up for the Lord. You are so much revived and you can take on the world. All of a sudden, something happens and yeah. it's hard to explain it. You can't explain it. Everybody around you, is, are, your brethren are saying, what happened to you? I mean, like, you are serious for the Lord and then all of a sudden you just turned 180. What happened? And then you go, I don't know. I just can't explain it. Yeah. Do any of you know what I'm talking about? 100%. Of course, that never happened to you, right? It's only Elijah because he's a weakling, right? Do you know what I'm talking about? Something unexplainable happens that shakes you to the core. And you don't know what it is, but it just shook you up so much that you just stopped reading the Bible, stopped praying, you just gave up on the Lord, you just backslid. That's what happens. Why? Verse 2 the devil sends a messenger. The devil just sends a messenger, and we don't know all the details of what happened, but whatever that messenger did to you, it just shook you up. Yeah. You, know what the, you know what Paul said about his thorn in the flesh? Yeah. He's a strong Christian soldier. But you know what he even said? A messenger of Satan was sent Whoa. to give me that thorn in the wow. flesh. And Paul was so... He hated that thorn that he wanted God to take it away. Yeah, yeah, it happens. It only takes a messenger. 
It only takes one messenger from the devil. That's unexplainable, but it just shakes you up and really bothers you. Amen. You know what you need to do when that messenger comes? You need to really see that whatever the messenger says to you is really not there. That what you're feeling and thinking and whatever caused you to be shook up is all fake. It's a hallucination. You gotta look. You know what uh, verse 3 said about Elijah? And when he heard that, is that what the Bible says? He didn't hear Jezebel say that. It says verse 3, and when he what? Oh. Saw that. What do you mean he saw? The messenger was the one who told him to his face. Not Jezebel. Not, he didn't see all that happen. You know why? When the messenger came and told him, he was seeing something that shook him up. We don't know what it is. We poke fun at Elijah. You know, how can you be scared about one woman says, but if you were in his mind and his heart and his feelings, he was seeing something that other people didn't see. And that caused him to lose his faith and seek for suicide even. You know what you need to do? You need to keep your eyes not on the details of that messenger. That's your problem. You let that messenger come in and slip in, shake you to the core, and you see every detail of it. And sin, what you so despised, became so delicious. And then the fear that you hated became more realistic to you. And that hardship that you, realized, that you thought, I can control it, suddenly became a huge mountaintop and impossible to overcome. You know what happened? You were seeing every detail of the messenger. You cannot see the details of the messenger. I don't know what it is that shook you up after the revival meeting. I know that somebody out there who's listening to this message, I'm hitting you right now. If that is you, you need to stop looking at the details of what the messenger is showing to you. Instead, you need to see the details of those prophets of Baal that you overcame, the fire from heaven that you brought down, the rain that you prayed for and God brought, and the running that you did to beat King Ahab. You need to see those details. You need to see the details of your revival meeting. You need to see the detail of each and every brother, sister in Christ's face that you remember who got the victory. Every brother, sister in Christ who went on the altar and wept before God. The details of that preacher pointing his bony finger right at your face saying, repent. You need to see the details of Jesus Christ. Where he said, I love you, child, at that revival meeting and then patted your shoulder as you wept on the altar and said, here, give me that sin. Give me that burden. Do you see those details? You don't see the details of your revival meeting. You see the details of the messenger of Satan. That's what happens after revival. And you need to get your eyes off of that demonic messenger and set your eyes on Jesus Christ, what he, the Holy Ghost messenger of what he brought to you at the revival meeting. You need, to, you need to see the details of the shouting, the running, the souls that got saved and souls that got baptized. You need to see the details of the revival, not the details of sin. Look at Jonah 3. Jonah 3. I hope this is helping you. I hope this is helping you. Jonah 3. You can see that all of this is coming to pass after revival. And these things will help you. These things will help you when the devil starts attacking. Look at Jonah 3, verse 4. Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. The Bible says, And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. <laughs> Just one sentence. Verse 5, So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. What in the world? What a revival. He got a whole city repent by Just one sentence. 
That's, that's something else. And then look what Jonah did at chapter 4, verse 1. Jonah shouted the victory. Nope, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. What a, what, what's the matter with you, Jonah? Yeah. He said at verse 2, and he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentance thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. You know why? It's because Jonah didn't want that revival meeting to happen. But it happened. That's why after the revival, he was upset. You know what your problem is? Your problem is you don't want a revival meeting to happen. That's why after revival, you're like Jonah. Why is that? Because don't you recall those times when you went to a revival meeting, there was something demonic in there you can't explain. There's something dark in there that says, oh, I know what's going to happen. When I hear the preaching, I'm going to get convicted and I'm going to get right with God and I'm going to repent. I'm sick and tired of that. And I'm just going to go back to the flesh and then when I go to church again, God's going to convict me and I'm going to get right with God again. I don't want that. Do you know what I'm talking about? Was there that dark side to you where, you know, the brother and sister say, hey, come to the blowout, come to the revival meeting, and you're like, no, 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 I'm not going there because I know what's going to happen. Because I have a good reason to be angry right now. I have a good reason to stay in this sin. Hey, listen, in this worldliness, in this decision and stubbornness of mine, I don't want to go to church because I know that preaching is going to get me upset. It's going to convict me. It's going to make me feel guilty. It's going to put the fear of God into me. I don't want that. Do you know what I'm talking about? People, you got to realize this. There can be some people who just come to church because they just come to church, but deep down inside their heart, they don't want to be here because they know that the preaching is going to convict them. Is that one of you today? That's what the devil's going to use. But I have a simple question for you at verse 4. Verse 4, Then said the Lord, Doest thou well to be angry? Hey, simple question. <laughs> you ever thought about, hey, what are your best reasons to be that angry? <laughs> you ever thought about that? What's your best reason? The Lord exposed it at verse 9 through 11. This is it, verse 9. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry even unto death. But you know what God said at verse 10 and 11? What, uh, if, you're so, if you have so much pity on a little gourd that you didn't even work for, why don't you have that much pity over the, the people, thousands of Nineveh and babies over there as well? Shouldn't you have more pity for them than your little gourd? You know why you're bitter like Jonah after a revival meeting and you're like, man, I don't want to come to church. I don't want this revival meeting. After the revival meeting, there's that bitterness because you know you got hurt. You got convicted. You got stabbed by the word of God. It was so powerful. And you hate that feeling. You hate that conviction. You know why? Because you're upset about your little gourd. Your little gourd is your job. Your little gourd is my own selfishness. Your little gourd is my own way, not what the preacher said, my own way. Your little gourd is my own plan. Your little gourd is my world, my worldliness, my sin, my fleshly desire. I don't know why the preacher and the preaching is asking that I have to do more for the Lord and come to church and serve God. And, you know, it's that little gourd that is really a little gourd. It withers and dies. Everything in this world is temporary, withers, and dies. Don't you know that? Your thing is a little gourd. That's why you got upset. But you don't pity, you don't pity your fellow loved ones who are praying for you. 
who are, who are helping you to serve God. No, you don't pity them. You could care less. You just come to church because. You don't pity lost souls dying and burning in hell. You don't pity that. That's why you could care less about giving tracts and coming to soul winning, visitation, being bold to tell someone how to get saved. You're more upset about your little gourd, pride, self-reputation, how good you look, more than a soul dying and burning in hell. You pity your little gourd. You don't even pity your own happiness. You don't pity your own happiness, your true well-being, your peace in the Lord. Spiritual blessing, physical, even physical blessings from the Lord. You don't pity those things even. Instead, you pity your little sin, your little selfish way, my way, my way. I know it's making me sad, miserable, depressed, and, but you know, it makes me temporarily happy, whatever. I don't care. You pity your gourd, not your real happiness, your real well-being. What's worst is you don't pity the grieving Holy Spirit of God inside you. You don't pity the Lord. Every time you say, no, I'm going to do my way, my way, my way. Revival, I hate that revival. It hurt me and it's, it's convicting me. I don't like that. I don't like that. You're grieving the Holy Spirit every time you resist the Holy Spirit convicting you. You pity your little gourd rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. What hurt him more than those nails on the cross is your stubborn flesh. Your sin is what grieved God the most, you got to realize, at Calvary. My seventh point, the clearing after revival. The clearing after revival. Go to uh, Nehemiah 9. Nehemiah 9. Book of Nehemiah. You know what happens after a revival meeting? Oh, the children of Israel got right with the Lord. I mean, if you, oh, we don't have much time, so I'm just going to say this briefly. But if you look at Nehemiah chapter 9, the whole chapter, it shows that Ezra was preaching on a pulpit of wood. Everybody stood up in the congregation for the reading of the word. Every single child and age and elderly person understood what they heard. And the people had a huge revival meeting where they were weeping and where they had joy and laughter and fellowship. What a huge revival meeting. But guess what? There was still sin after revival. There were things that were not cleared. And if you look at chapter 13, Nehemiah got to work. He was cleaning up Tobias's uh, apartment in the temple. He was uh, running out people who were uh, intermarrying with the pagans and the lost people. Got rid of Sam Ballot's things. Uh, forced the people to worship the Lord on the Sabbath during the times of the Old Testament to get to church, so to speak. I mean, there was a lot of clearing that was done from Nehemiah, if you look at chapter 13. You know, the problem with the children of Israel was they got a revival at chapter 9, but chapter 3, they didn't clear their sins, clear the hindrances. Your problem is after revival, you got revived, but you don't clear. Listen up now. Within every revival, there has to be, there has to be some things you clear. It's impossible that you get revived from a revival meeting without getting rid of something. Every revival meeting, there's something. Every time you come to this altar, there's something you're getting rid of. You know that? There's something you're getting rid of. What is it? Don't just say, oh God, I'm sorry, and that's it. Or, oh God, use me, that's it. Or, God, help me to be a better person. That No, 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 no. An altar is something you sacrifice and burn. You go, God, I get rid of this. If you're, what is your sin problem? You know, it may not be that sin problem you're bringing on the altar. It may be a deeper issue of yourself behind that sin that's causing you to repeat that cycle all over again. And that's the reason why every time you confess that sin on the altar, you repeat that pattern again. Why? You didn't get rid of that deeper cause that you should have laid on the altar. 
That's what you need to get rid of. It's probably shame, you know that? Shame is a big issue because they don't want to look bad. They don't want to be humiliated. They don't want to admit that they're wrong. Maybe you got to realize the reason why you keep committing that sin, you're a workaholic. You're afraid of how other people might see you. Maybe you're running away from a deeper problem. It's your pride. It's the unwillingness to confess and seek help or counsel, maybe. The unwillingness to bow your knees and pray to the Lord for help. Oh, I need to get victory on this matter. Did you pray? Well, I'm just too... To what? Oh, it's too hard or too busy. That's your deeper issue. You need to get rid of that. If there's... You, some of you know I'm hitting something. There's something in your heart that you don't want to surrender on the altar. If that's the case, you can have as many revivals you want. You're going to go back to zero. You need to lay it on the altar and you need to get rid of that thing. My, seventh, my eighth point is the confederation after revival. The confederation after revival. You can look at Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 47. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 47. We won't go there for time's sake. But you'll notice that Peter, he was preaching a message and there was a huge revival where those wicked Jews who crucified Jesus, they turned to 180 and then they became Christians. And they actually sold their belongings. They united together. They, uh, they sacrificed their worldly things to help out the church and souls were being increased. You know what you were seeing? After a revival meeting, there was so much confederation. There was so much gathering. You see, read verse 41 through 47. You can see they were busy. You know why after revival, the greatest danger to you is isolation and idleness? Because you're not within that revival meeting crowd. And the worst combination for you, what will happen after revival meeting is, <sighs> Revival's done. Time to catch up and rest. And, and yeah, I'm just too tired to go that Sunday. And oh, I got work at Monday, so I got to get ready because summer camp, the revival meeting at summer camp really wore me out. Isolation and idleness. And while you're laying down, the same old temptation came back to you again. The same things you kept at your home that you were supposed to clean up are still there again. Free. And you know what? That's your danger. And depression came up again. Loneliness came up again. Misery came up again. Yeah, you know why? You yielded to your enemy. Isolation and idleness. How do I not fall for that? How do I read my Bible? How do I uh, serve God? How do I get victory over this? Simple, get busy with God. That's your problem. You, you look at Acts 2. They were busy with the things of God. You're not busy with the things of God. You know, you know why you got a revival meeting at summer camp? You were busy. Yeah. Yeah. Busy with fellowship. Amen. Because when you're done with one brother, then another sister comes. And when you talk to that sister, then another brother comes. And then you talk yourself silly and then you go on till midnight. Yeah, that's right. You're so busy with the things of God that, hey, you got a whole chapter to memorize. <laughs> you're so busy with the things of God that here's your Bible reading and prayer time. You're so busy with the things of God, you don't have time to watch this. Because you got two sermons that day. Yeah, praise the Lord. You know what you need to do? You need to get busy. When you're isolated and when you're idle, that's so dangerous. If that home of yours is really getting you to fall back, you need to get yourself busy. Go outside and soul win. Go outside, pass out tracks. Go outside even just to just go outside. Just go outside just to go outside and just spend time meditating on God's creation or something or pray to him. Amen. Be so busy with prayer and Bible reading. Amen. Good. Amen. So busy. Amen. Drag your... Uh, oh, well, I... You know what's so funny? 
For people who are so busy that they can't come to church or do something for the Lord, they have too much idleness and isolation in their hands to sin and fall back into the ways of the world again. No, you're not busy enough. Drag yourself to church, bless God. Drag yourself to Bible reading. Drag yourself to prayer. Drag yourself to soul winning. Drag yourself with fellowship, you know. Attend all 50,000 Zoom meetings, I don't care. Watch all the videos that we have on our channel too. Do something, listen to preach and get yourself busy. Busy yourself with singing hymns and let's see yourself falling back to rock music after that. Too much time and space you created in your mind for the enemy to fit in, to come in. My ninth point is Acts 19. Acts 19. Uh, we have to go over there, Acts 19. That way you can understand Acts chapter 19. And if you look at verse 17 through 20, you'll notice right here the people believed, they got saved, and they repented. They burned up their sin, their worldly possessions. It amounted to, thou uh, it amounted to hundreds of thousands of dollars. It amounted to a lot of money, perhaps, what they burned. They burned so much. There was a huge revival meeting. But then look at the counterattack. That's my ninth point, the counterattack after revival. Verse 23, and the same time, see the revival meaning, the same time there arose no small stir about that way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. You know what he did? He got the people. At verse 28, where there was a huge revival in Ephesus, now turned around. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians, and the whole city was filled with confusion. After revival, where you burned up all your expensive sins and your own flesh that was so precious to you, don't think everything will go quiet after that. The enemy will counterattack. You know what you did today, church, after your revival meeting? You made your enemy angry. If you get angry, are you just going to let it go or are you going to do all that you can to pay back? Do you know what vengeance means? Vengeance requires constant energy, nonstop. And such high concentration with a refusal to give up until you see your enemy fall. Amen. That's Amen. what vengeance is. Now, think about this. Don't you know that Satan has that in his mind? The Bible doesn't say Satan takes a nap. No, the Bible says, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour 24-7. And guess what? He's angry. He's angry. You think he's happy when souls got saved, souls got baptized, over a hundred singing and shouting, weeping, coming on the altar? You think he's going to be happy or do you think he's angry? And he's going to work nonstop until, let me dwindle the numbers here at church. Let me dwindle their fire and their spirit. He's going to do all that he can to make a comeback. You know what you need to do? If he counterattacks, you need to counterattack. If he has vengeance, you need to have vengeance. You know what 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 11 says? Yea, what vengeance when you repented against the wicked things. That's what you need. Vengeance requires constant energy, nonstop, high concentration with a refusal to give up until you see your enemy until you see your enemy fall that sin that worldliness that flesh that self of yours that devil that temptation fall you should have such a vengeance and say I will fight I'm not gonna stop I can't have peace until I see that enemy fall Bless God. What you need to do after revival meeting is have such deep vengeance. 
Do you have a deep vengeance after revival? Go non-stop. Go without sleeping. Go without resting. Until you see the enemy shiver, fall, and see him get more upset when you win a soul. See him more down when you read that book. See him, the look of defeat on his face when you bow on your knees and pray. Get vengeance today. Now after revival, let's see some Christians with a vengeance. If he's going to come back on you, you make a comeback to this altar. Every head bowed and every eye shut. Let's come back to this altar with a vengeance.